you can say wow. Because it is a wow moment, isn't it? That is just extraordinary. It's so powerful. So it's Pentecost. And uh, what we're going to do is explore how God is present amongst us. Not simply at one moment in time in history, which was Pentecost, that Pentecost Sunday, but throughout the whole of the Bible and today. So if we could go with the first one, please, Chris. So when the Bible speaks of God, speaks of the Holy Spirit, speaks of God's creative presence being in touch, there are three ways it does it. And, and those three ways would have been absolutely essential to uh, Epaphras when his heart was warmed and transformed by the risen Jesus and he set up a church in Colossae. It's where the Bible begins and there are three ways the Bible speaks of God's presence, God's spirit. And the first is that of Shekinah. You've got to love these Hebrew words, haven't you? Isn't that a great word? Shekinah. It's God's glory. It's God's presence. It's God as God is. And if you will, it's, it's the sort of thing which transformed Paul on the road to Damascus when the full glory of God in the presence of the risen Jesus changed everything. Then there's Hochma, which is wisdom and purpose. It's actually what God wants to do, what God wants to achieve. So you have God's glory, you have God's wisdom and purpose, and then you have this fantastic word, my favourite Hebrew word. You have ruach. And you've got to have a bit of phlegm to do this properly. Ruach. Go and say it with me. Ruach. A bit more. Ruach. Because that's the living breath and activity of God. That's how the Bible starts, isn't it, in Genesis 1, with God's presence, the living spirit. And it's what you see all the way through. That would have been the breath and the activity that so overwhelmed Epaphras, he founded a church. So we've got three ways on Pentecost Sunday, which we want to unpack what God is doing, God as spirit in our midst. So if we go to the next one, Chris. So the first one, the Shekinah, the glory, the vivid, burning, bright presence of God, intense, amazing, a mountaintop experience for Moses, or a burning bush. But it's that moment when you get the sense of God as God is in all of God's wonder and majesty and glory. And it changes everything. It reframes everything. Once you've had a sense of the vivid presence of God, God's amazing glory, nothing looks the same ever again. And the Bible is shot through <coughs> excuse me, of those sorts of experiences that people have when they glimpse that amazing glory. And that glory overshadows this church, doesn't it? Well, I'm not so sure, look at you. <laughs> Doesn't it? Because it just changes everything. We're not dealing with a God that is like a pet hamster, folks. Do you know that you give a bit of lettuce to and you keep in a cage and it's domesticated and basically it lives within the boundaries you set? That is not what the scriptures understand by Shekinah or glory, is it? This is the living, raw presence of God as God is, which renders us speechless and awestruck and changes the way we see everything. And that's what really is important. All the way through Scripture, it's there all the time, this amazing sense of God's glory. Next one, Chris, if we could. Which is partnered with what that glory is trying to achieve, the creative purpose of God, which in the Old Testament, it's chokmah, it's wisdom. And you can see from the wisdom of Solomon, for she is a reflection of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God and an image of his goodness. It's those reflections we get of what God wants us to be and do and where God is at work. Now that's the tender of a black five at Gromont. But what can you see reflected in it? 
lots of people. Loads of them. And when you look at society, when you look across the world, when you look at our church, when you look at our lives, you see reflections all the time of what God is doing, of what God's purpose is, as lives are changed and transformed and liberated, and as God is prompting us to do new things, don't you? Don't you see? All around us, these reflections of God's glory and God's presence. And then we come to the third way of speaking of that amazing presence of God. And it's the Ruach. Go on, let's have another go. Ruach. Ruach. (laughs) The breath, the wind, the spirit of God that you can see is present by what it does. And what's shaped the tree? The wind. What sort of wind? Um, Powerful, Chris. Powerful, persistent The tree is shaped by the wind in the same way that the church is shaped by God's spirit. And our lives are shaped by God's spirit. The living presence of God. The Ruach bursting out on the disciples at that Pentecost. The Ruach of God. So changing Epaphras' life in an instant that it was shaped with the life of Jesus. And a church was born and burst. Because that's what God does, the Spirit. It brings to life. It births. So we've got Shekinah, Chokhmah. We've got Ruach, the ways of speaking of God's presence. So Pentecost ain't just Pentecost, is it? That's what I want to show you. It's not just about one particular day when the Spirit came. Pentecost, if you will, is what God does all the time and what we should expect. So next one, Chris, if we can. So Genesis 1, the Spirit of God hovers over the surface of the waters and what happens? Not a lot, David, no, not a lot, I'm afraid. Transformed. Life itself, creation is birthed. The Spirit of God challenges the darkness and the emptiness and new life and the whole of creation. God's purpose creatively in touch. The Ruach let loose. That's what God does in every single moment. Whatever the darkness, whatever the emptiness, whatever the struggle, whatever the pain, whatever the grief, whatever the loss, that's what God is doing. God's Spirit is calling something new and hopeful into birth. Next one, if we could, Chris. And that's what the scriptures tell us, that the spirit of life, the breath of life, is what gives life. Job says, the spirit of God has made me, the breath of the Almighty gives me life, and the psalmist declares, when you send forth your spirit, they are created, you renew the face of the ground. That looks like Pentecost to me. It's what God does. God sends the Spirit. Next one, Chris. And so when we cannot see a way through, when we are stuck, when life is just too hard, when we are not coping, when we just cannot think of how we are going to get out of this situation or what the future holds, we stand with Ezekiel with that great question, can these dry bones live? Yes. (laughs) Preach it, sister. And the answer is always from God. Let's say it together. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. That's an imperative, isn't it? That's a definite. It's not a... Do you know, we're not into any doubt here, are we? God says to us, if that's our truth, if all seems lost, I will put my spirit within you, you shall live. That's why Pentecost happened to the disciples at that moment. Next one, Chris, if we could. And so Easter, Easter Day, in an upper room with frightened, confused, 
bewildered disciples who hadn't a clue what to do or what was going to happen next, who thought it was all over, you have the Easter day, Pentecost, when Jesus appears and breathes his spirit into his disciples and transforms them and sends them out. It's Pentecost, isn't it? It's the pattern that you see time and time again. Next one, Chris, if we could. And there is Pentecost, Pentecost, the feast of Pentecost. But the process that we call Pentecost, the fact that we call Pentecost, is what we see in all churches. That's what we see in Colossae. When Epaphras goes back, there is this wildfire, this outbreak of the Ruach of God, and God is pouring God's Spirit so that everybody can be included, nobody left out. That's the pattern, that's the process which we celebrate on Pentecost Sunday. And it's true of this church. It's the Spirit, it's the wildfire of the Holy Spirit that keeps us moving, isn't it? Do you know, there are some times it feels like it's pushing uphill. <laughs> what are you struggling with? Because I can see some of you are struggling. What are you struggling with? It's what we hope for, but what we don't always see. It's what we hope for, it's what we don't always see. It's those reflections in our midst that we look for, those intimations of what God is doing. We hope for it. We wait for it. It may not be as dramatic as it was on that first Pentecost. But I have to tell you that the Holy Spirit is being outpoured amongst you all of the time because I see it. And I know it's true here. In those small ways, in those big ways, this is what God is doing. Next one, Chris, if we could. So in Matthew's Gospel, we see God doing what God does and the Spirit descends onto Jesus. And John the Baptist says, look, I baptise with water, but he's going to baptise with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit anoints, the Spirit lifts up, the Spirit gives purpose. The Spirit is God's presence creatively in touch with all that we are. So it's what we should expect to be normal like breathing in and breathing out. Next one, if we could, Chris. And then there is that hidden Pentecost, that gentle hallowing which we celebrate at Christmas, when the Holy Spirit blesses Mary and she gives birth to Jesus, God's gift, God's human face, the Holy Spirit at work in that gentle, hidden way. Maybe that hiddenness is really true for ourselves. And it's why testimony is so important when we can share the ways in which the Spirit is at work amongst us. Next one, Chris, if we could. And so to Colossians, where it all comes together. And everything we've said about how the Spirit works is true. Because we start with Paul, an emissary of Jesus, and he's an emissary of Jesus because what happened to him? He had an amazing experience of the presence, the glory of God in the risen Jesus who transformed him. He was spirit-filled and he served at God's pleasure from that moment on. That's our identity. That's who you and I are. We are emissaries of Jesus. We represent Jesus through the power of the Spirit and we serve at God's pleasure. That's why God raises up the church. And in this letter, it's just so beautiful that the Spirit wants to gather everybody together and set us free 
And what Paul does, he writes to encourage with Timothy, Epaphras and his church. And so he writes and says, Dear holy and faithful brothers and sisters. It really matters when somebody encourages you, doesn't it? When somebody actually notices you and encourages you as you are, that's what Paul is doing. That's what the Spirit is doing through Paul. And it really is central to how we are as people and as church. To offer that encouragement, that thanks, that gratitude to each other and praising God's purpose in raising us up to be holy and faithful. And notice it's in the family of the anointed who live in Colossae. They're a family. They're together, drawn together by the Spirit to live to God's pleasure and be holy and faithful in their context. And that, as we see, was quite a struggle, wasn't it? Not so much for these people, but you think of some of Paul's other letters, you think about what was going off in the church in Corinth, and it wasn't pretty. But he writes to encourage, he writes to praise their faithfulness. And he begins this letter with those words, may grace and peace envelop you. You see, we're so familiar with this stuff, it just goes over our heads. We want to get into the meat of the letter. We want to get beyond the opening pleasantries. But those are the most important words in the whole letter in some ways. Because it's Paul's attitude to these people. His understanding of what God wants for them that shapes the beginning. And that's why he says grace and peace. The two things we need more than anything else. What does grace mean? Unconditional love. Unmerited, unconditional love. The grace of God that we can never deserve. And Paul is saying, look, that grace and the peace it brings, knowing that God loves you as you are unconditionally, that's the most important thing. Let's start there. Let's start from that place. You're holy, you're faithful. God wants to fill you with grace and peace so much that you will be enveloped by it. And a church that's enveloped by grace and peace, a church that's holy and faithful, is a church in which the Spirit will be at work powerfully. And then as always, we've been praying for you, thanking God for you. So a church full of grace and peace a church serving at God's pleasure is a church where prayer will be natural and normal. Yeah, I felt your prayers this last week. They have uplifted me and I am in a better place because I know you've been praying. And you were a very praying church. And that, for Paul, is at the heart of what it means. We offer grace and peace and prayer for one another, and we thank each other. We are kind to each other. And look, your love for his holy ones. We don't just keep it to ourselves, but we share it. And we love one another in a way that makes a real difference. So you can come through those doors as you are, messed up as you are, carrying all the stuff and the baggage that we do, and you can come through those doors and the message is, God loves you unconditionally. God wants to give you peace. Put the baggage down. Let it go. Come in and know this truth for yourself. We pray for each other. We love each other. We're there for each other. Because the hope from heaven is our reality and our truth. And I love this next bit, because Paul, he's not diffident, is he? You know, he's not like some shy politician. There's a sort of, I hesitate to say it, but in terms of being confident, there's a touch of the Farage about him <laughs> when he stands there, because he opens his mouth and it just comes out. It's not filtered. It just, you get it. 
whether you like it or not. And, and what Paul is doing is saying something so wonderfully outrageous that it's fantastic. It's straight from the heart of God. Because he says, look, the gospel that was brought to you is growing and bearing fruit all over the world. You don't have to be ashamed of it. You don't have to be timid. What you've got, others have got, and boy, is it growing all over the world. How would you feel if that's what you were being told? You know, you're, you're struggling in your little church. You've just started. Everything's against you. It's tough. And suddenly Paul says to you, hey, what you've got is brilliant. It's growing and bearing fruit all over the known world. You would, wouldn't you? You'd be blown away. Wow, what we've got is setting the world on fire. Do you believe that's true today, though? Because statistically it is. There is amazing growth all over the world. Methodism worldwide is growing like topsy. Well, we think, oh, well, we're a traditional church, you know, it's, it's all not as it was. It was better in the old days. No, it wasn't. The best times are yet to come. Because God is God. A God of glory and purpose and presence. And so Paul is saying, yeah, look, we know we're in the Roman Empire. We know it's a struggle. We know we're being persecuted. We know it's not easy. But look, this is growing. Why? Because of God's glory. Because God is who God is. I have to tell you, God doesn't take no for an answer. Does he? No. God wants that grace and that love and that prayer and that thankfulness and that kindness to transform everything. Since the day you heard and took in the truth of God's grace. And then there's Epaphras. This church exists because of one person. Could be that he was converted at Ephesus when Paul was preaching there, but he was converted, and look what happened, because he was open to the power of the Spirit, to God's glory, to God's purpose, to God's presence, to God's permanent Pentecost. Look what happened. A church was founded and grew. We are here because of people like him. And who are going to be here in the years to come because of people like us. Pentecost is for you and me, sisters and brothers. It's our present reality and our truth. Next one, Chris. Thank you. So that's where the Bible encourages us to look to trust in the glory, to look for the purpose and the wisdom and to be open to the breath and the activity of God. And when we are open to those three things, Pentecost is our truth, our reality, our reason for being. Because when we are open like that, the risen Jesus is a flame at the heart of the church. So on this Pentecost... We're not celebrating one thing that happened yonks ago. We're celebrating what God is doing in this present moment as he calls us to open our hearts and welcome the glory, the purpose and the presence.